in chapter 3, we developed the market forces of demand and supply and used them to understand price determination in the free market system. We also saw how changes in the non-price determinants affect supply and demand and how equilibrium could be restored when the price is either above or below equilibrium. We will now use these tools to study the concept of price controls. The objectives of this chapter are to appreciate the differences between price ceilings and price floors, and also to understand that price controls have unintended consequences. Loosely defined, this means that often, a policy has unforeseen results that are often harmful and economic irony. And these unintended consequences mean that policy actually can hurt the very people it was supposed to help. Price control basically is an attempt to set or to manipulate prices through government intervention in the market. In most cases, price controls are enacted to ease perceived burdens on the population. For example, when President Nixon imposed price controls in 1971, he was trying to help U.S. citizens from the threat of inflation. And he accomplished this by imposing a 90-day wage and price freeze. This price freeze was greeted with cheers from consumers who had grown wary of rapidly escalating prices and believed that they were being gouged. There are mainly two different ways price can be controlled. The first is to set a price ceiling. And this is a legally established maximum price for a good or service. An example of a price ceiling is rent control where government puts a minimum rent that can be charged to tenants in a way to help tenants pay lower rents the second is a price floor which is a legally established minimum price for a good or service an example of a price floor is the minimum wage this also is a wage set by government high enough that consumers can afford a living. To see why price ceilings like rent control usually do not work as planned, consider the following thought experiment in which we use the power of our economic imagination to solve a hypothetical problem. Suppose that inflation is rising and the government is concerned that the economically disadvantaged will not be able to afford essential foods. Therefore, the government caps the price of bread by establishing a price ceiling of 50 cents per loaf, about the half the price of a typical generic white bread today. Does the new policy accomplish its goal? What are the logical repercussions? First of all, as we know, the law of supply and demand tells us that if price drops, consumers' demand will increase. At the same time, the quantity supplied will fall because producers are receiving lower profits for their efforts. The result will be a shortage of bread. Secondly, producers can maintain their profit by reducing the size of each loaf of bread. So we no longer see giant loaves. They can also lower the quality of the product by using cheaper ingredients and give up production of fancier varieties, which is also a consequence that we did not see when establishing the maximum price for bread. We know that loaves of bread will become harder to find, smaller, and generally of lower quality. However, there is much more to think about. What happens to the opportunity cost of finding bread? Since bread is harder to find, people who want bread will have to wait in line to get it. 
this increases the opportunity cost of getting bread and also black markets will develop to help supply meet demand as a result many of those who do not want to wait in line or who do not succeed in obtaining bread despite waiting in line will resort to illegal means to obtain bread this means that sellers will go on the ground charge higher prices and deliver to customers the bread that they want without all the hassle much like alcoholic beverages under prohibition in the 1920s now not all price ceilings are effective when this is the case the price ceiling is said to be non-binding this figure shows a price ceiling of two dollars for a loaf of bread in the market and two dollars here is above the equilibrium price all prices at or below two dollars are legal prices above the price ceiling which is the red shaded area are illegal but since this market is in equilibrium at point e and this point occurs in the green region which is legal then the price ceiling does not affect the functioning of the market and it it is therefore non-binding price is regulated by supply and demand and as long as the equilibrium remains below the price ceiling we are fine when a price ceiling however is below the market price it creates a binding constraint that prevents supply and demand from clearing the market in this figure the price ceiling of bread is set as 50 cent a loaf of bread and since 50 cents is well below the equilibrium price of one dollar this creates a binding price ceiling notice that at a price of 50 cents quantity demanded is greater than quantity supplied because of this a shortage exists shortages will typically cause the price of bread to rise but under a price ceiling only the price in the green shaded region is illegal therefore the market cannot reach the equilibrium point at e which is one dollar because it is located above the price ceiling in the red area which is illegal and since the price mechanism is no longer able to legally ration the good what happens a black market develops for bread the black market price is also set by supply and demand but notice in the figure that the supply curve created by the price ceiling is vertical as we see here it is vertical since prices above 50 cents are illegal sellers are unwilling to produce more than this quantity let me use pointer Sellers are unwilling to produce more than this quantity, QS. Once the price ceiling is in place, producers cannot legally charge higher prices. So the incentive to produce along the original supply curve does not exist anymore. And since the shortage still exists, the intersection of the vertical supply curve and the demand curve at point E here establishes a black market price of $2. The black market price, price rather, eliminates the shortage caused by the price ceiling. However, the price ceiling has created two unintended consequences. A smaller supply of bread is produced. As we see here, quantity supplied is less than the quantity demanded. And a higher price exists for those who are forced to purchase bread on the black market. Now this figure shows the result of a price ceiling that remains in place over a long period of time. Here 
the supply curve is more elastic than its short run counterpart in the previous figure. The supply curve is flatter because producers are able to respond by producing less bread in the, run, in the long run. As a result, the quantity supplied is quite small. As we see here, it's smaller than before. In the long run, producers will convert the equipment used to make price controlled bread into equipment used to produce similar products that are not price controlled, like bagels and rolls, where they can earn a reasonable return on their investments. Likewise, the demand curve is more elastic in the long run. For instance, as we remove short-run constraints on the consumers, more people will attempt to take advantage of the low price ceiling by, ad by adapting their eating habits and changing recipes to use more bread. A flatter demand curve means that consumers are more flexible and as a result, the quantity demanded expands and becomes much larger than it was in the previous figure. Now, increases in elasticity, now, sorry, now increased elasticity on the part of both producers and consumers creates a larger shortage, as we see here, in the long run than it was in the short run. As a result, products subject to price ceiling become progressively harder to find in the long run. And more importantly, the unintended consequences we observe in the short run are magnified. Often, the government intervenes in the market with the goal of helping a specific group. However, we usually see unintended consequences. An example here is rent control, where government sets a price ceiling on apartments or housing to help low-income renters find affordable places to live. Now, shortages are an obvious result. When the price is kept artificially below the equilibrium, the quantity demanded is always greater than the quantity supplied. However, long-term shortages may be even worse. An investor looking to invest in a project may decide to build an apartment complex if he expects a return of say $1,000 per unit per month. However, with rent controlled units, the return on the apartment may only be 500 per month. The investor decides not to build the apartment and this exacerbates the shortage in the long run. Because of rent controls, landlords cannot maximize their profits. They have a diminished incentive to maintain their properties. So you see a reduction in the quality of apartments and the apartments become run down. A classical example is Mumbai, India, where they have rent control. They have used rent control in this place for an extended period of time. And as a result, there are many dilapidated buildings which fall down on a regular basis during the monsoon season and often with tragic consequences. Now, the rent control policies have led to the decay of many apartment buildings and contrary to the intent of the legislation, fewer housing choices are available for the poor. The common word slumlord comes from the words slum and landlord and it describes a landlord who does not maintain the property. Now with black markets and bribes to gain access to rent control units, low income people are often kept out due to the inability to pay the high entry fee to gain access to the units. Landlords may also charge key money, like they charge you for the key, they charge high deposits, they charge for furniture rentals, and a lot of other fees just to make more revenues because they cannot no longer make those revenues from higher rents. And these are some of the unintended consequences that we see as a result of price control. Now often housing gridlock ensues. This means people are not moving and no new units open up. People will be afraid to move out of rent control units since 
they may not be able to find lower prices again now once rent control unit is vacated oftentimes the property is generally no longer subject to the rent control so it's not made available many rent control apartments are passed from one generation to the next in order to remain in the program rent control units are already occupied and those who live in them are not likely to give them up the attempt to make housing more affordable in the city has ironically made housing harder to obtain it has also encouraged the building of upscale properties as opposed to low income units as we see in new york and this has created a set of behaviors among landlords that is inconsistent with the ideals of justice and affordability that rent control was designed in the first place to address as with price ceiling rent control causes a shortage to develop and because rent controlled apartments are vacated slowly the supply of units will diminish or will contract in the long run which causes the supply curve to become more elastic demand also becomes more elastic in the long run causing quantity demanded to rise the combination of fewer units available to rent and more consumers looking for rent controlled units leads to a larger shortage in the long run as we see in this graph compared to the short run shortage price gouging is a phrase that is probably used too often when consumers think that they are paying prices that are too high however we often willingly purchase goods even if we think they are too expensive think about snacks at a movie theater or an airport or a slice of pizza and a drink at a basketball game price gouging laws often state to some effect that it is illegal for a company to charge prices that are excessively high in the event of a natural disaster however in the event of disaster the demand for goods such as generators water and gas rise and this often indicates a higher willingness to pay but due to the law it is illegal to raise the price and this creates a shortage prices act to ration resources when the demand for generators or other necessities is high the price needs to rise to ensure that the available units are distributed to those who value them the most more importantly the ability to charge a higher price provides sellers with an incentive to make more units available if you limit the ability of the price to change when demand increases there will be a shortage therefore price gouging legislation means that devastated communities are relying exclusively on the goodwill of others and the slow moving machinery of governments this closes off a third avenue entrepreneurial activity as a means of alleviating the condition now price gouging laws serve as a non-binding price ceiling during normal times however when a natural disaster strikes price gouging laws goes into effect therefore if demand for gas generators increases immediately following a disaster this will raise the market price from 530 before to 900 after but since 900 is seen as profiting from a disaster sales at that price are illegal because of the maximum price under the gouging law this creates a binding price ceiling as long as the state of emergency is in effect and as we have seen whenever a price ceiling is binding it creates a shortage in this case the normal functioning of supply and demand to ration the available generators is short-circuited since more people demand generators after the disaster than before those who do not go to the store in time tend to find empty spaces where the generators used to be when the emergency is lifted and the market returns to normal the temporary shortage goes away and the price gouging legislation becomes ineffective once again recall that a price floor is a minimum legal price 
oftentimes producers of the product like farmers and those people who benefit from minimum price legislation tend to lobby for this legislation to be in place as we did for the case of a price ceiling let's do a thought experiment here again in the case of a price floor what if a price floor of six dollars is placed on a gallon of milk you cannot charge for a gallon of milk below six dollars what will happen what are the unintended consequences that we'll observe consumers will purchase less but producers will be willing to manufacture more this will result to a surplus of milk and there will be stacks of milk on the shelves as we see here also since the price floor of six dollars is high enough manufacturers can make their products more attractive by increasing the size of each container to try to attract people to buy the products also because of the surplus sellers will have a strong incentive to undercut the price floor in order to avoid having discarded le milk left over otherwise they'll have a lot of surplus which will go bad and they'll have to throw it away if they have trouble selling the products then they cannot be better off so as much as the minimum price was intended to help you you can only receive the help that was intended if you are able to sell the product a price floor set below the equilibrium will be non-binding since the actual market price is above the legally established minimum price the price floor does not prevent the market from reaching the equilibrium point consequently the price floor has no impact on the functioning of the market however when the price floor is set above the equilibrium it becomes binding in this figure the price floor is above the equilibrium price so there is a downward pressure on the price market forces always attempt to restore the equilibrium between supply and demand at point e at a price floor of six dollars quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded so a surplus exists the surplus is the difference between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded since the price mechanism is no longer effective sellers find themselves with unwanted inventories of milk buyers are unwilling to purchase more than qd since they are not allowed to pay less than the price floor so at prices below the price floor the demand becomes vertical when a price floor is mandated the typical downward sloping curve does not exist as a consequence the intersection of the vertical demand curve and the supply curve at point eb establishes a lower black market price of two dollars which eliminates the surplus caused by the price floor however the price floor has created two unintended consequences a smaller demand for milk and a black market to ration the sale of milk again in the long run consumers are afforded the chance to find good substitutes for milk at lower prices and this added flexibility on the part of consumers makes the long run demand for milk more elastic in an unregulated market as a result the demand curve depicted here is more elastic than its short run counterparts and qd is quite small the quantity demanded is quite small what happens to supply in the long run producers are more flexible and therefore supply is more elastic the pool of potential milk producers rises as other closely related businesses are able to retool their operations to supply more milk the flatter supply curve reflects this flexibility as a result quantity supplied expands and become much larger than it was before the increased elasticity on the part of both producers and consumers makes the surplus larger in the short run and the unintended consequences we observe in the short run are magnified an example is the minimum wage and the minimum wage is the lowest hourly wage rate that farms may legally pay their workers and it functions as a price floor now often the rationale for the minimum wage is to provide a living wage for the working poor who are unskilled now a binding minimum wage will result to unemployment in the short run since the quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded in the short run minimum wage workers can be skilled or unskilled 
and they can be experienced or inexperienced. The common thread is that these workers, for a variety of reasons, lack better prospects. A minimum wage worker might be a high school student looking to find a first job, or a senior citizen supplementing retirement income, or an unemployed worker looking to make ends meet between higher paying jobs. Since the market equilibrium wage is below the minimum wage, supply and demand cannot eliminate the surplus of workers. The minimum wage prevents the market from reaching the equilibrium wage at E because only wages in the green shaded region are legal. Any wages below the minimum, like $7 in this example, are illegal. The demand for labor is a function of its costs. Because the minimum wage raises the cost of hiring workers, a higher minimum wage will lower the quantity of labor demanded. Some of the unintended consequences of a binding minimum wage are unemployment, which is caused by a decrease in the quantity of labor demanded and a corresponding increase in the quantity supplied as firms seek to replace jobs with capital, if possible, machines. Sometimes firms also relocate to countries without minimum wage laws and others will shorten the available work hours. However, proponents of minimum wage laws are aware of the problems caused by the minimum wage. That's why they also advocate for additional training and education of low-skilled workers. The minimum wage is often non-binding or below the market wage rates. Consider two non-binding minimum wage of $7 and $9 an hour. $7 an hour is far below the equilibrium wage rate of $10. So supply and demand will determine the wage. Suppose that politicians decide to raise the wage rate to $9, giving us a new minimum wage. The new minimum wage of $9 remains below the market wage rate, so there is no impact on the labor market for workers who are willing to accept the minimum wage. Therefore, an increase in the minimum wage from $7 an hour to $9 an hour will not create unemployment. Unemployment occurs only when the minimum wage rises above the market wage rate of $10. Politically, the minimum wage is popular because raising the wage makes politicians seem to be caring or benevolent. However, economically, raising a non-binding wage will have no effect as long as the new floor is still below the equilibrium. It will have no effect on the market. Now, locally, it has been shown in some studies that states with the highest binding minimum wage also have some of the highest unemployment. Studying price control for the first time can be a little bit difficult because it's often confusing to understand that a price ceiling is below the equilibrium and a price floor is above the equilibrium. Now, the way to understand this is look at the ceiling in your room. Is it causing you any problems? What happens if the ceiling is only four feet high? If the ceiling is brought down low, that will cause you problems because you won't be able to access heights above the ceiling. Now, for, for the floor, you can Look at the floor in your room and see, can you still get to your desk at the current floor height? What if the floor was too high? So these are the ways to look at these things so that you can understand what the minimum price is and what the maximum price is. Because the minimum price that is set is often set above the equilibrium for it to be effective. And a maximum price is set below the equilibrium for it to be effective. Once a minimum price is set, you cannot go below it. And as long as it prevents you from accessing the equilibrium, then it becomes effective. And when a maximum price is set, you cannot go above it. And it prevents you from reaching the equilibrium, therefore it becomes effective. Now to conclude, 
We've seen that prices act as signals and give information to consumers and producers. However, we've also seen that price controls can distort these signals. And price control policy should actually be done with caution because it can have unintended consequences as we saw through the lecture. Now, as a summary, we saw that a price ceiling is a legally imposed maximum and we know the resulting uh, uh, effect is a shortage, which is problematic. Prices no longer act as a signal to, uh, to indicate the scarcity of resources. And we saw that two unintended consequences are a smaller supply of goods and a higher price for those who turn to the black market.